Welcome back to the tense and frightening world of the medieval English monarchy. King Edward IV is now dead, and his son, the young Prince of Wales, is being brought to London for his coronation. But is he safe? Probably not. Since Richard is among the group escorting the prince, and Richard wants the crown for himself. Queen Elizabeth senses the danger and has taken her youngest son, the Duke of York, to church sanctuary in Westminster Abbey. Meanwhile, the Queen's relatives, Lord Rivers and Lord Grey, have been imprisoned in spooky old Pomfret Castle. Will Richard manage to steal the crown from his nephew? Let's find out. When the Prince of Wales arrives in London, he wishes he had more uncles there to welcome him. He's referring, of course, to poor Lord Rivers and Lord Grey, who are awaiting their fates in Pomfret. Richard and his minion, the Duke of Buckingham, try to convince the prince that his uncles are dangerous and that they are there to protect him. Yeah, right. When the prince asks after his little brother, the Duke of York, Buckingham blames Queen Elizabeth for keeping the boy in church sanctuary without proper cause. Buckingham orders the Cardinal and Hastings to fetch the young Duke of York from his mother by force if needed. Yikes. When the prince asks where he should stay until his little brother arrives, his protective Uncle Richard casually suggests that he should sleep in the Tower of London. You can almost hear Shakespeare's audience yelling, Run, Prince, run! The young prince is intelligent and gracious, which makes Richard even more eager to get rid of him. Richard can't have anyone stealing his thunder, not even a child. When Lord Hastings and the Cardinal bring the young Duke of York, the two brothers are reunited. We also get to see how cheeky the Duke of York is with his uncle Richard. Richard clearly isn't great with kids and barely tolerates the little boy's smart mouth. He hurries both the boys off to the tower and tells them that their mother, the Queen, will meet them there. Is Richard about to chuck her in the tower too? Richard and Buckingham have now recruited Lord Catesby into their secret plot to make Richard king. Catesby's job is to recruit Lord Hastings, which may be tricky since Hastings was loyal to King Edward. But that's no biggie. If Hastings doesn't cooperate, Richard will just chop his head off. But hang on, why would anyone want to help Richard? He's such a dangerous toad. Well, it turns out that Richard has bribed his flunkies with promises of lands and titles if they help him steal the crown. But will Richard keep his promises if he becomes king? What do you think? When Catesby goes to lure Hastings to the dark side, Hastings refuses. He'd rather have his head cut off than see the crown go to Richard. Be careful what you wish for. For him, Edward's son, the Prince of Wales, is the rightful heir to the throne, and that's that. Hastings' friend, Lord Stanley, feels an impending sense of doom. He warns Hastings that security is an illusion around Richard. Even Hastings' enemies, Lord Rivers and Lord Grey, felt secure before Richard sprung a death sentence on them. Speaking of which, over in Pomfret Castle, the execution is getting underway. The Queen's brother, Lord Rivers, her son, Lord Grey, and her loyal friend, Sir Thomas Vaughan, are all about to lose their lives. Why? Because they're in Richard's way. He wants to make sure that the Queen has no one to turn to when he steals the crown from her son. As they walk to their deaths, Grey and Rivers remember old Queen Margaret's curses. Someone must have been listening that day because her curses are coming to fruition. When word gets back to Richard that Hastings refuses to take part in his plot, Richard dials up the drama. 
He waves his withered arm in front of all the nobles, claiming that he's a victim of witchcraft. And not just any witch. This is the Queen's handiwork. Richard accuses the Queen of conspiring with Hastings' lover, Mistress Shaw, to use black magic against him. When Hastings fails to harshly condemn the two women, Richard calls for Hastings' head to be chopped off. Poor Hastings. It looks like old Margaret's curse has now landed on his head. As he goes to his death, Hastings warns that those who smile at his terrible fate won't live long either. So, now that English royals and nobles are dropping like flies around Richard, what will be his next move? To manipulate the public. Richard summons the Lord Mayor of London and puts on a show. Richard and Buckingham dress up in rusty old suits of armour and pretend like they're under attack. When two of Richard's flunkies bring in Hastings' severed head, Richard and Buckingham convince the Lord Mayor that Hastings had to die. He was plotting to murder them. It's a shame the Lord Mayor hadn't been there to witness Hastings' confession, but Lovell and Ratcliffe had to destroy the villain. Sounds legit. Is the Lord Mayor gullible or what? Maybe he's just afraid to speak against Richard, which is understandable. In any case, the Lord Mayor leaves to tell the citizens that Hastings' execution was just and fair. Richard orders Buckingham to follow the Lord Mayor and influence what he says. There are a few extra lies that Richard wants the public to hear. Like how King Edward's children, including the Prince of Wales, are illegitimate. How Edward apparently executed a man over a minor misunderstanding. That Edward was a giant sleazebag. And that Richard's own mother, the Duchess of York, had an extramarital affair that resulted in Edward's birth. This last lie is a risky one, considering the Duchess is still alive and well. Will the people buy any of this? If the Scrivener's opinion is anything to go by, the citizens will be sceptical. The Scrivener's role is to copy out royal proclamations, like orders for execution, to be read out to the public by an official known as the Recorder. As the Scrivener reads over the charges against Lord Hastings, it's obvious that they're a fraud. If the multiple charges against Hastings took 22 hours to write out, Hastings would not have been a free and happy man only five hours ago. He would have been locked in the tower ages ago. The Scrivener sums up the state of the world. It's a bad place where speaking the truth can get you killed. When Buckingham returns, he reports to Richard that the citizens' reaction was frosty. They didn't buy the stories about King Edward, and they didn't cry out, God save Richard, England's royal king. In short, Buckingham's pep rally for Richard was a real fizzer. It was only when the recorder repeated Buckingham's words, under duress, that a few people showed some support for Richard. Since the masses are still sceptical, Buckingham decides to change tack. He tells Richard to act scared, look innocent, carry prayer books, stand between two priests and refuse to be king when Buckingham offers him the role. When the Lord Mayor and citizens arrive, it's showtime. The Lord Mayor is already on side, so Richard only needs to win over the citizens. He does as Buckingham instructed appearing to the public more like a shy monk than a proud monarch. Buckingham pleads with Richard to accept his ancestral destiny and take the top job. Richard graciously declines the crown three times before accepting it begrudgingly. What a performance! And the citizens fall for it, hook, line and sinker. It's decided... Richard will be crowned King of England the following day. 
Will anyone have the courage to stop him? And what will happen to Richard's nephews who are stuck in the tower? Now that he's neutralised their claim to the throne, he'll release them, right? Stay tuned for Act 4. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons, check out our other videos.